want to take a moment to thank uh, Dean Wendy Perdue and the School of Law for their generous support in hosting our event this evening, as well as the National ACS for their support. And I'm personally honored to share Mr. Hainsworth's story because I got to know him um, over the last fall while I was writing a paper about his story uh, before the court had made a decision. So it was nice to actually get to know him on paper first and as well as a person later in the semester. And so the format of uh, this evening, uh, first I'm gonna give a brief overview of the facts. I know that a lot of people here are probably not uh, too familiar with the case. You've probably heard news stories and stuff. I just wanna give everybody kind of an overview of what happened. Then we'll have a moderated Q&A discussion, and then we'll leave plenty of time for you guys to ask questions of the panelists as well. And then finally, we'll conclude with a nice uh, reception in the atrium. So we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, so without further delay, uh, We'll give you the Thomas Hainsworth story. Okay, so Richmond 1984. Um, in January and February of 1984, a series of rapes uh, within a one mile radius terrified a community in the east end of Richmond. The attacks exhibited a highly distinctive uh, modus operandi in which the perpetrator raped and robbed young women early in the morning, usually at knife point and on a couple of occasions with a gun, and he identified himself to his victims as the Black Ninja. On January 3rd, 1984, J.S., the director of a daycare center, was raped and robbed at knife point while preparing to open the center. The assailant fled the scene when a parent arrived to drop off her child. On January 21st, DK was raped and sodomized while sitting in her car outside of the grocery store where she worked. The perpetrator stole $60 from her purse and forced her to perform oral sex on him. A third victim, LD, was attacked on January 27th while leaving her house for work. The assailant threatened her with a knife and demanded her purse. She told the man that her purse was inside of her home. When he permitted her to go inside and retrieve it, she locked the door and called the police. On January 30th, M.A. was leaving an apartment complex parking lot in Henrico when a male approached her with a gun. He lured her to the side of an apartment building, frisked her for money, and forced her to perform oral sex on him. He then led her into a nearby wooded area where he raped her repeatedly for several hours. After the attack, the man asked her for her phone number and called her the next day with instructions to meet him at Trio's, a local supermarket. A fifth crime took place on February 1st when a man wielding a gun approached TH as she was walking from her home to her car. He tried to follow her into her home, but was chased away by TH's dog. As a result of the attack on M.A., the police had been staking out Trio's market in hopes to find an assailant meeting the description provided by the victims. On February 5th, 18-year-old Thomas Hainsworth was walking from his home in the East End to Trio's market to pick up groceries for his mother. He was approximately one block away from his home when he was stopped by a police officer that told him that he met the description of a local rapist. Thomas denied any involvement in the attacks. Thomas was arrested and booked on rape, robbery, abduction, assault, and burglary charges. He had no criminal history at all prior to his arrest. One of the victims, TH, identified Thomas as her attacker. Soon after, the other four victims also identified Thomas from photo arrays as the man who attacked them. Thomas was charged with all five of the crimes. One of the crimes was Noel Prost, and he was acquitted of the attack on DK. The evidence in each crime was highly based on eyewitness identification because the DNA technology used in today's criminal investigations was largely unavailable. Instead, Jurors relied on highly emotional testimony from each victim, and Thomas was convicted and sentenced to 84 years in prison. 
Despite Thomas's incarceration, the attacks on women in the East End of Richmond continued throughout 1984. On, November, on December 19, 1984, a man named Leon Davis, who lived in Thomas's neighborhood, was arrested and charged with 14 rapes. Davis is currently serving seven consecutive life sentences for those crimes. Thomas served 25 years of his sentence in Southampton Correctional Center. He was then transferred to Greensville Correctional Center. He maintained his innocence throughout his incarceration. He never took his anger out on anyone because he knew that someday and somehow his innocence would be proven. Instead, Thomas spent long days in the prison library. He earned his GED, he studied six different trades, and he completed community college courses. He also began researching cases that bore any resemblance to his own. In 2005, Governor Mark Warner ordered the Department of Forensic Services um, to test DNA, to test all biological evidence from uh, crime files that occurred between the years 1973 and 1988. Thomas's crimes fell squarely within this range. Thomas sought help from the Mid-Atlantic Innocence Project. Sean Armbrew, director of the project, represented Thomas through the proceedings. In 2009, DNA results implicated Leon Davis as the assailant in two of the crimes. One of those crimes was from um, a trial in which Mr. Hainsworth was acquitted. The Supreme Court of Virginia granted Thomas a writ of actual innocence based on biological evidence for the conviction. For the remaining two convictions, however, biological evidence was not available for testing. Governor Bob McDonnell asked the parole board to review Thomas's case. And in March 2011, on his 46th birthday, Thomas was released from prison. Attorney General Cuccinelli gave Thomas a formal apology and offered him a position in his office. Thomas is still currently working in the AG's office. Despite his freedom, however, Thomas still wasn't free. He was forced to wear an ankle monitor and adhere to a strict schedule. And the Virginia State Police also still registered him, registered him as a sex offender. And this is obviously not Thomas, by the way. This is Leon Davis, who's the black ninja, who's um, registered here on the website. So in July 2011, Thomas filed two innocence based on non-biological evidence to pursue full exoneration for his remaining convictions. Thomas was fully supported by Attorney General Cuccinelli. He was also supported by Richmond and Henrico County Commonwealth Attorneys Michael Herring and Wade Kaiser, the prosecutors in the jurisdiction of the remaining convictions. Because Thomas's writs were completely unopposed, it was surprising to many legal scholars and practitioners when the Court of Appeals asked for additional briefing on the issues. Additional briefs were filed, arguments were made, and Thomas patiently waited for an answer from the court. And just as a side note, this is obviously a dated picture of the Court of Appeals because we know Judge Powell's on the Supreme Court of Virginia now. On December 6, 2011, the Court of Appeals, in a fractured opinion, granted both of Thomas's writs. This was only the second time that a writ based on non-biological evidence had been granted in the Commonwealth of Virginia. And finally, after 27 years, Thomas Hainsworth was a free man. So now we have Mr. Hainsworth with us. <laughs> So as I discussed before, we have some moderated questions we're going to go through just to kind of flesh out uh, some details of the story, and we'll leave plenty of time for you guys to ask questions as well. So the first one's going to be for Mr. Hainsworth. Um, you've been on a remarkable journey, and 
What was going through your mind when the police approached you back on February 5th in 1984? Mm. Oh yeah, first thing I'm thinking about, you know, this can't be real, you know. Um, 18 years old, you know, um, no, no, no criminal record, not being in trouble with the law, you know. I just say, you know, y'all making a mistake, you know. And I just couldn't believe this happened. Uh, what did you do after you were arrested and tried with the crimes? Mm -hmm. What did you do after your trials? Well, yeah, after I, you know, got arrested and my trial, you know, I went back to school, you know, took some trades up, and after I done that, I took four years of college, so, you know. Okay. And Attorney General, how did you become involved in Thomas's case? Well, the Commonwealth Attorney for Richmond, Mike Herring, is somebody I've known for over 20 years. And uh, he and I got together, I guess, in December of 2010, if my memory serves correctly. And basically he said, look, I, I've taken a look at my case, meaning the Richmond case, and I think this guy might be innocent, and I think you ought to take a look at it uh, with an eye toward a writ of actual innocence petition and supporting the petition. And that was our introduction to it. Now, there was a lot of material to go through, and a lot of it, very old, 27 years old. Right. Uh, transcripts were incomplete. Uh, we were relying on newspaper articles in some instances to pick up pieces of information. And, um, and then made the biggest doggone spreadsheet you've ever seen of evidence across <laughs> about 20 cases. Uh, because of the relationship between the five you put up on the uh, on the screen there and the others later in the year, or the potential relationship as far as in December 2010, and trying to identify patterns, similarities, uh, various pieces of evidence that showed up or didn't show up in different cases, and uh, looking at the prospect that a, Thomas was innocent, and B, that Leon Davis was the proper perpetrator. Um, obviously, both aren't necessary from Thomas's perspective, but from the perspective of someone who is in law enforcement, uh, it makes a lot more sense if you actually have an alternative. There's, there's what's called a third-party defense. defense but for that, you need a third party. And it wasn't that we were looking for a scapegoat, it's that we were looking for accuracy. And as we went through the material, gradually came to a stronger conviction, no pun intended, that first Thomas might be innocent, and then gradually as we went through more material, uh, that in fact he was. Now, the two cases that remained, there was eyewitness identification in both cases, and as you mentioned here, one of them, the victim was with the perpetrator for over two hours. For some judges, that carried a great deal of weight. Uh, one of the people in Virginia, Marvin Anderson, who had been in Thomas's position before, uh, had been convicted in a situation where the perpetrator had been with the victim for over two hours. Now, in his case, it was DNA exoneration, right. um, definitively, like one in 6.5 billion chance were wrong, definitively, uh, demonstrated that he was not the perpetrator. You know, those things start to add up. Now, one of the challenges, and I'm sure we'll talk more about it here, is that the case for Thomas's innocence is entirely circumstantial. Uh, it is a mountain of circumstantial evidence, but no direct evidence. Now, one of the challenges with that is you have to keep in mind not to be overly theoretical. We're trying to prove a negative. We're trying to prove something didn't happen. Again, that comes back to why Leon Davis, and the, if he was the perpetrator, as the pattern seemed to indicate to us, was likely. And as you noted, 
the offenses continued. There was a lull for a month. There was another one in March, and they picked up in August and really intensified toward the end of the year. Um, that made a lot more sense, and we gradually, it took months for us to come to the conclusion and the conviction that Thomas was innocent. But once we came to that conclusion, we kicked into another mode, so. So assuming that Leon Davis is responsible for the crimes, um, Thomas, did you know Leon Davis? Mm, yes, I'm the neighbor. Um, he lived right down the street, about 50 yards from me, you know. Um, I had um, came in contact with about three occasions. Um, but we playing sports, you know, I very athletic in sports. And um, I had a circle of friends that we know, we go to the playground, play ball. And um, one afternoon he came down there and he said, we like to play, uh, I like to play on y'all team. So I uh, so no problem. I was just new to the area. We just moved in about two months prior to and I got arrested. So I went too familiar to the area. So, you know, he came, we played basketball and he seemed like a very likable person, you know. I knew his, at the time, I didn't know his wife, I knew his girlfriend. We went to school together, but I didn't know they were married, but I knew they was going together. Have you had any contact with him over the years? Since no. Been in the system? I think when I got locked up in 84, um, in February, he got locked up in 84 in December. And um, my mother, she's come down to jail, see me every Saturday from work, my visitation days. And um, on a particular Saturday, he was coming from the vision room. I was coming to the vision room. He said, I'm gonna ask you a favor. I said, what's that? He said, I talked to my lawyer about it. Since we look alike, I want you to come to court and sit in the defense table and the victim could pick you out and get me off the cook. And I said, no, I'm not doing that. You know what I'm saying? I said, well, I ain't got no more doing no courts. So I said, only time I'm going back to court if I'm gonna get the people back this time for something I do. But I knew he did something. I knew he did a crime, but I just ain't wanted to come all wrong to him, because I knew down the line I could use that to my defense. Professor Tate, um, I know you've been in contact, close contact with uh, Thomas's attorney. Um, can you share with us some of the challenges that his, attempt, his defense team faced? Uh, and I, I did. I, I had the opportunity to speak to Sean Armbrust, and I would applaud Sean Armbrust tremendously, the attorney general. and. Um, you for your response and uh, feel terrible about the experience you've undergone. Um, Sean Armbrust indicated to me that she really enjoyed partnering with the Attorney General. Um, one thing that I gathered from Sean was, and I, I think the whole legal community in Virginia, if not nationally, was surprised by the procedural unfolding of the court's response to the case. Uh, so what uh, Sean certainly indicated was that she had steadfast, ongoing, immediate belief in Mr. Hainsworth's innocence and that she uh, valued and respected the Attorney General and his office's work, uh, but that, you know, like many of us, she was very uh, surprised and befuddled uh, to a certain degree with this briefing uh, with the uh, you've already known, fractured opinion of the court. I personally um, believe that those imponderables or those surprises are clear indicators that the, the statute as written is cumbersome, wooden, um, and not supple enough for the kind of remedial scope and purpose that it was intended to have. And um, I hope in the long run that, that this case ignites a reconsideration of the contours of that statute. So speaking of, about the statute, um, Attorney General, I know you were in the Senate back um, when, I guess now Sheriff Stolle um, introduced right. the bill that became what we now know as the writ of actual innocence based on non-biological evidence. Were you involved at all in the drafting of the legislation? Uh, not the drafting, but I was in the middle of that. Um, and the year before is when it really started with Senator Marsh here from Richmond who brought a writ of actual innocence statute. And that was my uh, first year in the Senate. And I was on the courts committee my entire time there and that's the committee that dealt with this issue and still deals with mm -hmm. this issue. 
And um, the way they voted at the time was downward by seniority. So chairman first, and then on down the seniority ladder. So I was last. Uh, I was elected in a special election, so I didn't even show up at the same time as others in the Senate. And it was the first vote that I ever counted on my fingers under the table. Because, you know, it bounces back and forth. It's, it sounds like an easy thing to keep track of, but there's not an, an easy order to it all. And it came to me 7-7, seven, seven, seven Democrats for it and seven Republicans against it. And I voted with the Democrats to get it out of committee. Um, and then on the floor, got one of those Republicans, now Justice Bill Mims, to change his vote and my seatmate to vote with me, and we tied it up on the floor. And then Lieutenant Governor Tim Kaine cast the tie-breaking vote, not that <laughs> Lieutenant Governors ever get to cast many tie-breaking votes. Um, and it went to the House, where it d promptly died. Uh, however, it went two steps farther than anyone imagined it would ever go. And uh, so the next year it came back as the Chairman's Bill and written differently uh, for reasons I won't speculate on, but, but uh, uh, it passed relatively easily that year. And the only other use, you mentioned that Thomas's was the second case. The first case was a science-based case, a forensic case, um, where the question was, is the device a firearm? And that was a relatively simple scientific question. It strikes me, and I haven't ever looked into it, that it's one that should have been resolved before a conviction, um, but it wasn't. Uh, but when it was resolved, because of the writ of actual innocence, and when we say non-biological, we're talking about not DNA. That's what we're talking about. Anything but DNA. Um, and this was a different type of scientific evidence. So it was a relatively easy case. Mm -hmm. It wasn't a hard case. It was not opposed by the Attorney General's office. It was acquiesced in. And there wasn't much development of the law because there wasn't cause to develop much. It was easy. It was direct evidence. Mm -hmm. It was direct evidence. Certificate of analysis. That's right. right. You had all of that, and it was pretty straightforward. So that was the development of that statute politically. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I. You know, people in here can have their own view of me politically, but I'm on the courts committee a civil libertarian. Um, you know, defendants don't have lobbyists, um, and uh, I am someone who is very suspicious of all exercises of power by the state, and there is nowhere the state is more um, unequal in its exercise of power than in the criminal justice system. So. Uh, to my view, it's a classical liberal position uh, to, uh, to be careful in that exercise of power and in, and in how we structure our criminal justice system. So I'm glad we've got it. I agree it's not a particularly elegant statute. Um, not supple, wooden, all very good descriptions. Um, much more poetic than how I would say it, but, uh, but all accurate, all accurate. Nonetheless, I'm glad it was there. Right. And get into the statute. I know, uh, Professor Tate, you've actually had some personal experience as a defense attorney uh, with the statute. Can you share your thoughts about? Well, to go into more prose than poetry, I will say that the statute should not, I, I don't think it should be limited to pleas of not guilty. I don't think that there should be a, a uh, one bite at the apple, and I think the really difficult portion of the statute is the standard, which is um, a very, very, very rigorous standard. Um, I would like a standard. Uh, this is Supreme Court language. If you're going to ask me what my <laughs> dream standard would be, it would, we currently have no rational trier of fact could find guilt beyond a reasonable doubt, and the petitioner has to show with clear and convincing evidence based on the entire record that no rational trier of fact could reach that conclusion of guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. I would like, mm -hmm. it is more the like- re The record including it, new evidence. New evidence, yes. Yeah. 
it actually having to have, right? Yes. We're not there unless we yes. have new evidence. But I would like it to be, it is more likely than not that no reasonable juror viewing the record as a whole would lack reasonable doubt. That's what I would like, and that Supreme Court language from House v. Bell, conser you know, conservative, conservative court, that's, I'm not digging into 1960s jurisprudence or, or a more liberal epic in the United States Supreme Court. So I know that there are a variety of ways to structure the standard of proof. Um, Missouri has uh, uh, a more uh, relaxed standard, but a standard that clearly um, respects finality. And I want to be clear that I don't for a moment think that finality is a frivolous concern. And, um, it's more I, predominant in Virginia than in a lot of other places. I agree with you. I, I noted that in some of the pleadings that you described it as cultural, and and I, I agree with that. Yeah. Um, I think that, but I think that Virginia uh, has had enough experience in the last ten or eleven years to not be prideful about our culture, because again and again we have um, shown that people acting in good faith. Um, are um, operating under systems of rules and procedures that risk wrongful convictions. And again, 99% um, of the actors within the criminal justice system, law enforcement prosecutors, are acting in good faith and with the um, highest desire for professional excellence. So I certainly don't think this is, um, these are bad faith situations 99% of the time, but recently I know it, it um, is not something that your office missed, but the Urban Institute's um, preliminary findings on uh, possible error rates in Virginia. Um, but one thing I wanted to say, that, and I read, I listened to your press conference, and you said that, in, that a prosecutor's job is not to get convictions, it's to seek justice. And I thought uh, that those were very good words to hear. And um, I think it's, you've evidenced that in this case, but I am hopeful that this case will lead to some changes in the statute. Are you hopeful or interested Well, certainly, in <laughs> um, I'd like to see a more supple, less wooden statute. But uh, the, the standard is extraordinary, and you mentioned how surprised so many people were about, okay, the Attorney General is joining the petition. Why isn't this done? Uh, and there are two basic reasons. One, because we're past the point of ordinary finality. Right. Um, it is not like bringing a case, the null pros case, the middle one on, of the five, um, where the prosecutor has entire discretion at that point to simply drop the case, mm -hmm. to not bring it. Um, we're past, well past that point. So we also had to join the petition, if you will. I tell, technically, I lost. <laughs> uh, it's my favorite loss ever. So, uh, I'm, I'm okay with yeah. this one. And, um, but the legal standard is extraordinary, and the court's job isn't to acquiesce in what I want, even as the representative of the Commonwealth, which is my role in this case. Uh, it is to make sure the standard is met. Um, and if you read the three dissents, I have described them as full-throated oh. dissents. <laughs> yeah, um, it was, uh, first of all, one of the 11 judges couldn't sit because Steve McCullough came out of my office onto that bench. He worked on the early part of this case. Um, so there were 10 judges. So we needed six. A tie is a loss, um, meaning for the purpose of what we were trying to seek. Um, and the majority opinion took half a sheet of paper. Having read the petitions, reviewed the evidence, that sort of boilerplate, we grant the petitions, both of them. Um, and that's it. And, <laughs> and then about 25 pages of roaring dissent. And with a lineup of judges that is truly unique, um, to describe it as one observer, 
conversation that took place. What are you doing? I'm waiting for the rapture. Really? Why? Well, Elder wants to keep a guy in prison, and Kelsey wants to let him out. And, uh, you know, it's not where those judges necessarily always fall. And, but that legal standard, and the court did their job. Um, their job is to test everything before them against the legal standard. It isn't to just accept what we do, meaning in the Attorney General's office. Um, but I was continually confronted and understood the confusion to the rest of the world about what's going on here. Um, they have a different role to play. And um, they played it vigorously. I mean, we started at a three-judge panel, and they did not decide the case. The court took the case from the panel before it was decided, which is highly unusual. Uh, and it was heard on banc. I told Justice Powell that we had, because she was on the three-judge panel, we worked hardest on what we referred to as the Powell question. <laughs> um, what would you do if you were standing here defending an appeal instead of mm -hmm. seeking a writ of actual innocence? A very, very challenging question. A very challenging question. And uh, I argued the case, and the people in my office got seven hours of beating up the boss uh, in moot court, uh, mooting the case, uh, about two dozen, well, a dozen and a half of them. Uh, and we spent a lot of time on that question, because it was a tough one. So Thomas, what was it like going through this whole process uh, when you were trying to gain your exoneration and you still, you know, weren't completely free, but you were going to work and, you know, just kind of hoping that things would pan out? Oh, frustrating. You know, it was frustrating, you know, you still ain't totally free, you know. Um, they still got your life in your in the hand, you know, balance, you know. It's on, you know, on, on level, you know. Every day, you know, going to work, you know, but still, you know, you're not totally free, you know. There's stipulation, place you can't go, you can't go, you know, things you can do, you can't do, you know. So, you weren't totally free, you know. We needed that, just, you know, the victim, you know, just put everything behind us, you know. So, once I got totally free, you know, that was the biggest, you know, step forward right there, because even working for him, in his office, you know, and he gave me a job, you know, I still want to be, you know, rid of all the charges, you know. I just don't want that stipulation on my head, you know, because, you know, people still have their, you know, their opinion about this and about that, you know, and I don't want people to feel uncomfortable around me, you know, because I don't want to betray something that, I, you know, I'm not, you know. So, you know, it's the office and people in there, you know, they were real willing, you know, to be way patient, you know, for the outbreak of the very, so it was very frustrating, though. And, you know, when I met you, I was really impressed by your calm and very right. patient demeanor. I mean, I was a little mad that you weren't mad, so <laughs> yeah, I, know, yeah. I wanted to know, you know, when you were in prison and you knew that you hadn't committed these crimes and, you know, it had been 10 years and it had been 20, was there any point that you just wanted to just lash out or well, I mean, was going through your mind? I mean, when I was in there for 27 years, you know, <laughs> I had correctional staff, you know, I had uh, inmates asking me, you know, you know, you got the right to be mad, you know, with my situation, you know, but I would turn a bad situation into a good situation, you know. If I could have went off and if I could have this, I could have been a buddy, you know, but I would never have this resource to things I had, like the law library. You know, if I would have snapped, I would have been placed in the hole. Then I couldn't work on my cases. I couldn't contact the people, who, you know, who was with me now. So I just took that, the good, the bad and turned it for the good. I said, I'm better myself. You know, um, 18, I didn't get a chance to graduate. So I went in there first thing, I got my GED. Then I got trained and went to four years of college. Then I started working on my cases, you know. I got familiar with the law. So a lot of things that I didn't have on the street, that I got knowledge and got a blessing in there. You know, so it turned off from the good in a way, though. And what was it like coming out after all those years? I know the world is a very different place. And I mean, yeah, it was very different, you know, coming back to, you know, city of Richmond, you know, a lot of things that, you know, uh, downtown changed, you know, people changed, you know, my neighborhood, old neighborhood, I went go visit on frequent occasions. That changed, you know, but so it was, it was kind of getting back to knowing people, you know, I mean, you've been going so, so long, it's just playing catch up. You know, computer with the internet and all that, and cell phone, it was a learning pro you know, progress. It was kind of tough in the beginning, you know, because so much I had to do with playing, playing catch up. I mean, first time I went to the um, gas station, I ain't not do work department. 
<laughs> you know, I know with the punk, you know. I'll sit there and lay you need the help? I said, no, I don't need the help, you know. And I said, yeah, come back, I need some help, yeah. So it was, it was definitely, yeah. And Attorney General, I wanted to talk to you a little bit. Of, you mentioned the dissents. Um, a lot of the dissents kind of had a notion that kind of, but for you being involved in the case, the court wouldn't have made the decision that it made. Do you think that that's accurate? And you know, they're given the brevity of the majority opinion. Um, really, it was just an order, more than anything. Um, it's hard to hard to gauge that because you don't know what you're measuring this against. I measure the force of the dissents, which is really unusual. I mean, it it isn't just because we were invested in this case and we were parties and all the rest. It is very unusual to see one dissent as strong as any of those three. Mm -hmm. And to have three in one case was pretty, pretty amazing. Which told me, you know, you can say 6-4, that's a close case. Yeah, it's a very close case numerically. But when I look at those dissents, I realize it was a lot closer than 6-4. Mm -hmm. I mean, this one, we got out of there uh, by a, a hair's breadth is my read of it. And, you know, that's not how I think it should have gone, obviously. I was arguing for a different position. Yeah. But uh, we'll take the W, or the L in our case. <laughs> but uh, it, it was, um, you know, if it made a difference, great. The outcome is what we were really aiming at. Um, and it just gives us more over the course of the next year to chew on as we look at the next session. We weren't going to be ready for no. this session on this statute, but we're going to take a close look at it over the course of 2012 and see if it warrants some adjustment and if, frankly, the politics are such that we can get the statute adjusted. Because, I mean, frankly, some of what isn't there right. represents political compromises and is, that's where the culture comes in, right. is there is a strong resistance to putting any dent in finality in Virginia. So this was a major change. I mean, it's one thing to have DNA evidence, which basically is an answer key, mm -hmm. if it's done right. Mm -hmm. But anything short of that was an extraordinary, extraordinary political hill to get over, which is why the history just of the bill is so important. To have gotten the early wins changed people's expectations. Um, and made it at least possible. But with, there's a lot we can do with this statute, I think, to make it a lot easier to work with. Uh, one of the suggestions uh, in the dissents was that the General Assembly could have written the actual in its innocent statute to provide a concession of fact by the Attorney General or by the Commonwealth's Attorney of the Jurisdiction in which the petitioner was convicted. Yeah. Um, that it should con receive considerable weight beyond that of a victim's own identification of the perpetrator or even be binding on the court. I just wanted to get both of you guys' reactions to whether you think that's a good suggestion or something that would fix the statute. You know, I think that um, the court clearly gave it weight, and I don't mean me. I think it mattered that I was there with Wade Kaiser and Mike Herring. Mm -hmm. um, it was the, if any one of those three weren't mm -hmm. in the same position, it would it would undo the other two, and that's a dramatic understatement. Um, and, um, you know, maybe the combination of them all would make sense to provide for some accommodation within the statute, okay. uh, some deference that's statutory. We were presenting case law where that court, not another court, but that court had identified deference to those with the expertise, the law enforcement expertise, in their conclusions to some degree, and to a great degree really, as appropriate to carry some weight in their deliberation. And I have to assume with some of them at least that it did. Um, with four, not enough, but mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's only one factor. Right. Um, because as you point out, it's not in the statute, and it could be. Uh, I think now that we have, I think the 
professor's comment, maybe it wasn't her main point, but the fact that we've had eight years go by now, three, four, July 1, 2004, so we're closing in on eight years by next session, eight and a half years. Mm -hmm. The one bite at the apple was the concern about um, just being rained down on repeatedly sure. like habeas petitions do now and, and other things. Um, and truthfully, 99% of those are not particularly meritorious. Um, but it's important for us not to be desensitized to that one or two or half a percent or whatever mm -hmm. it is that really are. Um, and it's, it's, it's a systemic problem about how to screen out the chaff while not knocking the weed out with it. I mean, that's a hard thing to do from a pure manpower standpoint. I mean, that is just a lot of work. It's a lot of work. What do you think about that suggestion? Um, I would be reluctant to definitively embrace um, that kind of... Um, suggestion because it's very, very complex and I'd, I'd have to see how it really um, would likely operate. Um, my sweet spot for this is the standard. It is the standard. The standard, I think, um, is such that we are operating very possibly in what's amounting to a symbolic zone. Um, yeah, it is the highest standard for anything that I know of in the law. Yes, it, it, it really is. And I do think that social, legal, cultural change happens incrementally. We've seen this time and time again in law and in society. So it's not that I have, I'm actively begrudging the early adopters or um, denouncing them, but I think that we have, na you know, um, what is the old saying? Law is not logic, it is experience. Um, that I think it was, may have been... Um, There's another um, saying about the law, too. <laughs> right, okay. <laughs> say it publicly. <laughs> right. Um, <laughs> but na I think it was Oliver Wendell Holmes. But um, nonetheless, we've had nearly a decade of operational experience with the statute. And mm. coterminous with that, we have had ongoing uh, DNA exonerations. So we are in parallel universes. We are seeing DNA exonerations. I, you know, we have maybe four, 14 individuals in Virginia that have experienced DNA exonerations. We have 289 DNA exonerations nationally, some 17 or 18 of those uh, serve time on death row. Um, if we go on too much longer in a remedial realm that is this strict and this seemingly disconnected from the facts on the ground, then it is going to start appearing as though um, there is hostility to the very possibility of relief. Right now, I am not willing to conclude that. But if this, and I don't mean by you, I mean by the, 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 the legislature, if this were to go on and on and on and on with uh, the evidence we have, the Urban Institute, the DNA audit that's going on, the, the genesis of that was you know, Earl Washington, Marvin Anderson, Governor Warner, um, all the work that the DNA project, the Innocence Project in New York has done, then I think we've got to get worried I, you know, in terms of what people are wanting versus what they are cosmetically putting together or symbolically putting together. Um, and so I'm very, very hopeful that the lived experience with the statute over time that people of good faith can get together and problem solve and recognize the importance of finality mm -hmm. and recognize the, the province of the jury. You know, the jury has a role. Those dissents seemed, if I may, ask the Attorney General, the dissents um, seem rather stung. It was a separation of powers um, imbroglio, and I think that explained the rapture, because we you know that <laughs> separation of powers questions can get the temperature up. So I'd be curious what your thoughts were on that. Of course, I don't agree with the dissents. Uh, I don't agree I with the outcome. I, I don't think the concerns were necessarily inappropriate. Right. Um, 
I obviously had my own view of the facts of the case and um, and characterized them rather differently. Yes. Uh, but um, and they also offer some insights as we go back into looking at the statute and where they drill down. Right. It draws our attention, yes. and it should. Mm -hmm. um, I would make two comments on yours, one sort of in the negative. Mm -hmm. I mean, remember in both of these cases, we had eyewitness who had not recanted their identification. Correct. One in each case. We overcame eyewitnesses, which is where the Powell question came from, is if you had an eyewitness, yeah. you'd basically the presumption that the judges didn't say this, but this is what they meant. <laughs> If you had an eyewitness and you were standing here, you'd tell us, the court, that's all you need. And as a matter of law, that's absolutely right. correct. Right. In one case, that's all we had. There was, that was it. Right. In the other case, there were three pieces of evidence. One cut both ways, the blood type, mm -hmm. which Thomas and Leon Davis had the same blood type. 20% of the population. Yeah, it, it, 36 percent of the population. So you've, you've eliminated two-thirds of your potential right. error, it, at least if you, want, if you think Leon Davis is your man. If he's not, you had a two-thirds chance of him being knocked out just with that. Right. Um, and then the other was an identification of a gun mm -hmm. and a plastic, a, really a, a toy gun recovered in Thomas's house which wasn't a gun, but looked like one. And uh, that was the other case. So remember, we, right. had, we had to overcome those things, sure. combined with this difficult standard. Now, on the other side, one thing that wasn't obvious to me at the outset of this that really began to worry me as we went through and as I read Turner and as we read some of the other cases is what DNA has done to our consideration of the legal standard. Mm -hmm. We took the legal standard from the DNA writ of actual innocence and Locked incorporated it. it over. As we wanted to say, same standard, everything else. But what happens is, when you have DNA, you aren't clear and convincing, you aren't beyond a reasonable doubt, you're into astronomical statistics. One in 6.5 billion. Now, in a few years, there'll be more than that uh, in terms of the number of human beings on Earth, but we're not there yet. So your odds are actually longer than the, if you picked, picked a random person on Earth with DNA. That, I believe, is skewing our view of the standard itself backwards. So you view the evidence in light, in, in a circumstantial case, in light of this other circumstance. So clear and convincing, I was an engineer. You know, to me, these, these stand, yes, spreadsheet, love them. Um, <laughs> and we got a great printer at the AG's office. It's like five feet by five feet. I can put the whole thing on the wall. But um, to me, I quantify things. And courts hate it, mostly because they're not engineers. They, to, to have a preponderance of the evidence, you need just past 50%. Simple enough. Clear and convincing, 75%. Yeah. Beyond a reasonable doubt, we can argue. 90, 95, 99. Um, but in the 95 to 99% range, somewhere above there. Um, that's quantifiable to me. And that's how I think of these things. And, like, you know, the courts hate them. Oh. I just think they hate the numbers because they're all from this arts and crafts school, you know. It's, um, <laughs> But uh, DNA leaves all that in the dust. And so when you then go to the next kind of case, you're thinking, well, this evidence isn't like the last case. And it is a very difficult discipline for the human mind to not be affected by that change in the world we live in, the evidentiary world we live in. It's a deep challenge for judges, and it's manageable if you think about it. But if you're the lawyer standing in front of them, it's a lecture if you tell them about that. Um, that's an awkward position to be in. Be much better if law professors wrote articles that they all read. <laughs> um, hint, hint. May I, um, <laughs> may I ask, really, when you mentioned, I, I do think we would be remiss if we didn't get into the eyewitness 
aspect of this, the social science aspect, which um, courts, you know, sometimes like social science and sometimes they don't, but the fact of the matter is, is that we have huge, huge evidence with regard to cross-racial identifications that they are... It's the worst form of evidence there is. There is. So you have a, a Powell, and Judge Powell, and she's thinking about, well, this is a case with two eyewitness, you know, two eyewitness accounts, and we simply have not educated the judiciary, to, to your point, about, or the public at large, about the weaknesses and the inherent problematic nature of cross-racial identification. So we know definitively... Well, nor jury pools about witness identification in the it, first place. Yes, absolutely. But in, in Virginia, you're not going to get a judge to take a jury instruction, you know, on any of this nonsense. Right. And I don't consider it nonsense, but it's deemed culturally, perhaps, in, as nonsense within the, mm -hmm. the, the judiciary. Um, now, we have 75% of DNA cases nationally, exonerations, where eyewitness misidentification plays a role. And then we have, of those... See, if you want to do better, don't call it social science. Call it empirical. Empirical, you're right. So you got exactly. 75%. You're, no, you're exactly right. It sounds harder. Yes, empirical. I agree with you. Um, and, but 40% of that 75% pertains to cross-racial misidentifications, and then, you know, rapes nationally, only 12% right, of them are cross-racial in nature. So it's a big mess. Do you agree? Oh, yes. The, the, I the, certainly do. So on this um, stool, this evidentiary stool that you rested on, and the combined force of, of the evidence that you relied on, was it, it was the DNA evidence in the other cases? Where the same misidentification took place. And what you don't have up here is the slide putting Thomas's picture and Leon Davis's next to each other. Right. And, I wanted um, you to talk, yeah. If you they're, talk a little they're, you know, you can look at it and say, no, nah, I can see the difference. Really? Flash them in front of you right. and tell me if you see the difference. Run your stress to the highest level of your whole life right. and see if you can tell the difference. Um, you can't. Um, one of the cases um, had uh, a, a victim who was five eight and a half. Mm -hmm. Thomas is not. <laughs> He's a little below that, about two inches. Right. Leon Davis is an inch and a half taller. Mm -hmm. Now, get, maybe it's my empirical bias, but. Taller and shorter is a much more objective thing to identify if you have the chance to stand up and observe someone standing up. Uh, then Absolutely. this is how tall they were, this is what they look like. Shape. Uh, there are, yeah, shape, yeah. Other, other things are more useful and more likely accurate. Yep. And uh, we saw that repeatedly mm -hmm. in, in this case. I mean, we had a, we had a ma I could, pile up, we had about 15 or 16 different considerations, some of them patternistic mm -hmm. with other offenses. That was why everything out farther into the rest of 1984 was so important. Mm -hmm. so. Well, we did promise the audience plenty of time to ask questions, so I wanted to give anybody uh, who had a question the opportunity to, to raise one. Um, and please make sure your questions are limited uh, to this case and uh, nothing outside of that. So does anybody have a question they'd like to ask for the panel? If you raise your hand, I'll come over with the mic. We must have talked too long. <laughs> Hi, Thomas. Thanks for coming today. I wanted to know, how did your um, opinions um, change from the day you were incarcerated through all the 27 years? I mean, I'm sure you had a difference in your attitude toward everything um, from when you were you know, 18, 19 years old until as you grew older? I think, you know, I got more smarter and wiser. Right? You know, when I was in there, I didn't really, um, like I said, I was never bitter, you know. I think, like, you know, I got told, you know, my lawyer, and I'll tell you about it, it just mistakes were made, you know. And I don't look at the victim that, you know, they did some wrong. 
they thought I was the one, you know what I'm saying? And it is me, honest mistake, you know. Um, you know, Mr. De uh, like I say, Frank Green wrote a newspaper, you know, in U.S. history. This is the worst case of mistake I did in the U.S. And um, I won't go back and search on something he said. Um, and she was talking about misidentification. When I first got locked up on that morning, when he locked me up that morning, this first lady who picked me out, she said I was the one. And when she came to court, she said she never could identify the person. So the judge said, and this one, she said, I've never seen him. But how you pick him out that morning I got locked up and said I was the one? And then she came to court, she said she could never identify the person. But right then I knew the police had to hang a part of play in there because they talked to her about three times. They were like, wanna to discuss it with her. And they talked to her, they said, well, we just pick him up around the street. And she said, well, he don't look like the one. Then they talked to her again. And by that time, I think about 25 police cars came in the area. And I was out there and I was talking. And I would tell him when the police officer, I said, something ain't right. I would talk to a black police officer. He said, well, something definitely ain't right. Then he talked to her again. They talked to her again. The third time, it came to I was under arrest. But through my whole journey, my whole 327, yeah, my, my um, root and chain was the law or nothing, you know. I'm still, you know, a big advocate for the you know, justice system, you know. It's just some cases going to be, you know, screwed. Some cases will be misunderstood. And some people get the break. Some people not get the break. In my situation, you know, I look at it that, you know, for me, I think really it's a blessing in disguise for me. Many people don't see it that way because it made me a better person. You know, it made me look at life more, you know, serious and more important. I, I think I treat the thing more important to me now. When you take it from a vibe and things are taken away from you, you get to appreciate that more. And they were kind of, you know, my whole perception about just, uh, judicial system and thing, it's still the same. You know, it just made, it just made me a better person. You know, I went in uneducated and I came uneducated. And I look at it all as a blessing. Hi, I have um, a question. I'm not sure if it can be answered, um, but it is in relation to this case. Um, and it's about reparations. Not looking at any specific amount, but especially in the case where there is a former one who's been in jail for 27 years. When they come out, are they gonna be provided with any financial benefit? Um, and is there some kind of psychological um, benefit you can provide them as well? Because many jails are like a war zone. So when they come out, they need to be reacclimated to society in a lot of cases. So what's the situation with that and how is that handled? You wanna answer that? Well, I say like, the, um you know, most people come up prison, you know, they do need some kind of something to fall back on and get rejected by to society. But what most people don't know about prison is they offer you a lot of programs. A person go in there and better themselves. They got GED school, they got trade, they got college, computer classes, they got everything. It's to the, up to the individual what you want to do while you're in there. And if they don't take advantage of them on the opportunity there, you know what I'm saying, when they get into society, they're going to fall right back in the same pattern get right around the street with the same people. And they do got things when you come off of ask cons, when you come out, they got a program to help you to get on your feet, you know, financial situation, stuff like living arrangement. They got all that. But in my case, I didn't need that. You know, I got a, my family been with some from day one, you know, and we got some business, you know, own a couple of grocery stores. So, you know, I was all right. But so, just an addition for you, Virginia law, we have sovereign immunity unless the General Assembly dispenses with it, and they have. What they did was they set up a formula for 90% of the median income during the time of wrongful incarceration. A fifth of it is paid out in a lump sum, and then the other four fifths buys an annuity that pays out over 25 years, if you live the 25 years, which is kind of lame. But um, uh, it's also capped at 20 years. Mm -hmm which I had not had cause to go look at before, even when I was in the Senate. Um, we're working with several senators to undo. There's no rational reason for a cap of years. In fact, it's quite the opposite. Frankly, it ought to, if anything, grow, not be cut off. So uh, that's something we'll see whether we get through in the General Assembly. And, you know, the, the from a more distant perspective that they have, uh, they'll also look, they'll look at the budget. I mean, that costs dollars, 
and the budget has been lousy for years. Uh, nonetheless, uh, this is one of those areas we, you know, we're pushing in all the right places and we're getting a decent response. We'll see what comes out on the other end, but um, that's one we're working with Senator McEachin on. I know Senator Marsh will be supportive. I've talked to Senator Stosh, you know, Senator, Senator, I was in the Senate, so it's where I start, um, though it may well be the House is more difficult, um, but uh, the Senate is more parsimonious with dollars traditionally, so, uh, but that's one we're going to try to get rid of this year, meaning the cap. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Lindsay had a question? Uh, uh, I just wondered how this case has affected uh, cases coming into the um, Attorney General's office. Have you seen more cases trying to get your support? And uh, also how you go about deciding when you're going to throw your weight behind a case of wrongful conviction? Not so much in the formal process have we mm -hmm. seen a change, but you know, I get my coat sleeve tugged in more places on my friend, my son, my, you know, et cetera. And um, that's a little bit difficult to stand in a hallway and, uh, I mean, I, I was a private attorney for 15 years before I became a public attorney. My own clients never fully got the story right. And for law students, it's worth remembering that. You never get 100% of the story from your own client. And, um, so I, I come in with that not distrusting, just informationally knowing what I hear is incomplete. Um, so that has picked up enormously, enormously. My email reflects a major influx. But in terms of the formal process of writs of actual innocence being filed, the petitions, um, I don't know that that has changed a lot. Uh, it's a slow process. I mean, you really got to it's a fair commitment of effort to undertake it. And one of the things, and I agree earlier comment, is to now, eight years later, to go back and look what the workload turned out like in light of the rhetorical expectations right. in committee and on the floor and all those things. I mean, this was not easily won just to get what we've got statutorily, but now we've got almost a decade to look back, and we should. We should. Over here, question over here. Um, oh, sorry. Okay, I'm not gonna stand, I'm lazy. But um, the question, you said something about sovereign immunity affecting the amount, could you explain as far as what do you mean? Yeah, it doesn't affect the amount, it affects whether anything's available. Um, absent a statute awarding compensation, Thomas would not have a legal case. Um, the Commonwealth is immune from suit, sovereign immunity, unless it exempts circumstances um, and allows its citizens to file suit. Um, today, we got a ruling in the Virginia Tech case that the president, Charles Steger, is not personally liable this was a procedural ruling in some fashion. This leaves only the Commonwealth left. The Commonwealth has made itself um, available for suit, but capped the damages. If they go all the way through, the most they can get, no matter what, is $100,000. Absent an offer from the Commonwealth to do something different, and, and I believe the offer was $150,000 all the other families got. Um, that is in the pure discretion of the General Assembly in working with the governor. That's what I meant by that. It's not a normal party. I think Adrian had a question. Can you kind of be loud? <laughs> more 
Well, not formally is the answer. Informally, I would say that uh, to, to quote one of the prosecutors in my office, you know, I sleep easily every night because I trust the system ultimately to weed out the chaff. Not that they don't make their own effort, they're part of the system, but that over the course of the whole process that that happens. And to have not one but two cases like this for just for Thomas is unheard of. I mean, nationally, I can count on one hand the number of times this has happened with fingers to spare. Mm -hmm. And um, so what I mean by informally is we talk about these prospects and we, we talk through the prosecutorial community in Virginia, but realize that the Attorney General's office, contrary to general understanding, is not the frontline prosecutor in Virginia. We prosecute health care fraud. We have gang prosecutions in some circumstances, always with the concurrence of the Commonwealth Attorney. Um, a few other areas, computer crimes. But 99.99% uh, .99 of criminal prosecution in Virginia is done by Commonwealth attorneys. And uh, they are independently elected officials, constitutional officers in their own right. They sort of set the program in their own office. Yep. Now the General Assembly can quarantine them, can make them do one thing or another, but the General Assembly, back to the culture question, is very, very tough on crime. This is not just reflected in finality. This is reflected in, I call it the fry the litter bugs mentality. <laughs> and um, I have other names for it. The felony ratchet. Penalties never come down mysteriously. They only go up. And a justice system is a system. You should start with, you know, littering on the left end of your chart, all the way up past murder to treason, and the penalties should run smoothly up from the bottom to the top. Well, that isn't the, how it goes. If you could plot them all, you'd have all these spikes. And I guarantee you, every one of those spikes has a story from a legislator. Either they lost a case they feel like they shouldn't have lost, or some judge was soft in a case where the legislator didn't feel like they should have been soft, and, and uh, your justice system is subject and uh, subordinate to your political system. And it is very hard to get elected to office as the defender of defendants. <laughs> and that is a reality and a problem, but it also requires electing people who are willing to step up and play that role. And, um, you know, when seen in a proper context, that can be cast very favorably. Um, and I would also note, I was heavily criticized in my nomination for Attorney General uh, and in my general election for not having been a prosecutor prior to assuming this office. And I think that in two years, not just in this case by any means, I think we've demonstrated the value or at least the lack of requirement of being a prosecutor to be an attorney general. Um, I bring a different perspective here. I was a defense attorney. It's not like I didn't participate in the criminal justice system. Did courts martial. Not a lot of people in Virginia can say that. but. Uh, not a prosecutor, and I came in with a healthy skepticism about prosecution. I have a healthy skepticism about everything, but, but um, sometimes overdeveloped skepticism. But, but uh, you know, there are very good prosecutors out there who play the role of a filter in the justice system that they are supposed to play, that mercy finds a way into their decision making. My caring. My caring. My caring would... would frequently be in that category. Um, the other end of the spectrum, you've got your prosecutors who just pull the trigger at everything that crosses their radar. Um, and that's a mess. And then you've got the folks in the middle who on one day or another can fall more in one direction or the other. And um, 
you know, I really appreciate the folks who are doing it right. Now, that's a hard balance, and it can make for some tough decisions. Not prosecuting is a hard decision. It is a hard decision. Uh, but it's a critical one to be willing to make. You shouldn't go into that business if you're not willing to make that decision. So. I think I probably do without a microphone. I just want to say, you know, Mr. Hanford, you're extraordinary. Thank you. And your generosity and your ability to give is, is truly uh, something to be admired. So thank you so much for all that, for being here to share that with us. Um, there's a, a there is one change being proposed to the writ this year to add juvenile convictions, juvenile adjudications of delinquency um, to, the, to the types of cases under which relief could be granted. And I understand from Thomas Painsworth's story that he was 18 at the time um, these offenses occurred. If he had been 17 and he had been convicted in juvenile court, he would not have had the access to the writ that he did. Um, is that something that you've considered supporting this general city? Um, frankly, it hasn't come across my desk yet. Um, the, of course, we certify a lot of juveniles, and in crimes like this, they almost certainly would have been certified, at least today, mm -hmm. not necessarily then. But um, so they get treated as adults in all respects, whether, you know, and I, we can debate how far that's gone and how appropriate that might be. But um, uh, certainly expanding the applicability of the writ is something that, as a concept, I would always look favorably upon. I mean, I was a strong supporter of it at the beginning. I don't regret it a bit. Frankly, I'm more fortified in, in it than I was, you know, nine years ago when Thank it you. started. I, I actually was a prosecutor under my care for six years, and there were many um, cases of this nature, particularly involving younger defendants, 14-year-olds, 15-year-olds, that would have been brought in juvenile court. So if that had been the case, Megan. Good evening. Um, this question is for Mr. Hainsworth. Have, number one, what are your feelings towards the women who we now know mistakenly identified you to the police and in court? And have any of them reached out to you and apologized or shared maybe their story? And I know um, in Professor Tate's class, we learned about a woman and um, she had wrongfully identified someone and they had had a bond over the years. And I was just wondering if, you know, how you feel about them now and if any of them have reached out to you. Um, just like a friend of mine, Marvin Anderson, I know, you know Marvin. And Marvin shared no one, you know, the victim in his case, you know, they kind of, you know, they close. Uh, my lawyer, through my lawyer, the victim, they tried to contact. They wanted to get in contact, but I told my lawyer not to time, you know. And like I said earlier, you know, you know how I feel towards, you know, just the honest mistakes we make, you know. They thought they were doing the right thing. I, I remember when I was in court and my attorney was Ron Chocolate, and I was sitting at the defense table and I would say, man, can you imagine what she's going through? He said, you out here feeling sorry for her, your life is on the line. But it's just compassionation. I said, what she went through, you know, you got to look what these victims went through, you know. Uh, I got three older sisters, I'm the youngest. And I can't imagine that anybody wanted my sister to go through that, you know. So I ain't got no hard feeling towards nobody, you know. It's just what I say, mistake, only mistake was made. They thought they was doing the right thing. They thought they had the right person. And I left it you on know, all of that. So somewhere down the line, we're going to meet, you know. We're going to talk, you know. So yeah, I'm looking forward to meeting them. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, and just one last question. So what's next for, what's next for you? Mm, like I said, I just want to do this. I'm, my thing is I want to own my own. Or a mechanic, you know, just somewhere down the line, I can see that happening, you know, and just, you know, traveling and enjoying life, you know, to the fullest. Just, you know, um, catching with old friends. First. Huh? Tell them where you went first. Oh, yeah, you know, Cowboys game, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Cowboys game. Yeah, Cowboys, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we lost. Every time I go, we lose, so I ain't going no time. So, <laughs> so, uh, uh, and the Jets beat them, and then when the Dallas with Philly, and Philly beat them. So I said, I just seen the stadium, stadium, and all that, you know. <laughs> it was good just going up there, but we lost, though, you know. But I just want to enjoy life, you know. You know, the rest of the years I got to do, you know, on this earth, you know, just surround myself with positive people, join my family, you know, my mother's still living, and just spend more time and spend with her. All right, 
I want to thank Thomas for being with us and the Attorney General and Professor Taylor. Thank you. Thank you.